especially for roughly 99% of the time of humanity, 99% of people have suffered, had no food, died at, before the age of 40. And all of that changed in 200 years. So the progress is absolutely undeniable. The only problem is that we do now need to think, how do we manage the consequences of that progress? How are we going to mitigate the impact that it's had on the planet and what kind of decisive action is going to be needed? Scientific action is going to be needed to address it. I mean, I think that the master of the master of survival has said, it's not the strongest. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It's the one most responsive to change. So what kind of response are we going to give? Cultural response is very important, and it has to come, but it may come too slowly. What we need is scientific solutions, and we need to get them out there very fast. So. This amazing panel is going to help us understand what's the best way to get this, these solutions out there very fast. Um, and the first question, I'm going to introduce them one by one as we go through. So the first question is for Stefan van Holzbrink. And Stefan is um, a lawyer and a publisher. Stefan is the chairman of the Max Planck Foundation and no. uh, on the no. board of directors of the, the Max Planck Society. Uh, Stefan is um, started and was the owner of Macmillan, Holzbank Publishing Group, Nature Springer, Scientific American, many others. But Stefan has also actually launched uh, or almost completed the whole innovation cycle, starting from the lab all the way into companies with a, uh, many different companies, Digital Science, Overleaf, Altmetrics, and so on. Stefan's also believed in Frontiers from the start, which, um, and strongly supported it. So Stefan, the first question is, with all these amazing leaders of different academic disciplines, do you think that we are responding to the science? Are the scientists responding to the warning signs? I think um, what we have seen in this wonderful day today is that scientists have responded amazingly well. And actually, thanks to science, we know for almost 40 years where we actually are. I mean, Club of Rome in the 70s, if you think about it, biodiversity reports which were pretty accurate in the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s. And, and if you think about the solutions, better irrigation, uh, more, more food productivity, uh, renewable energies, actually a lot of things are already there. It can be always improved and we have also mm -hmm. fought epidemics, all that. But the real question is, and I like the word responsive here in your, in your mm -hmm. uh, uh, citation here, uh, uh, responsive, are we, are we responsible? And I think this is, this is the real problem in the world. If you look at, uh, at the, the most serious problems and they were addressed today, on the one side it's poverty. If you're really poor, you can't afford the solutions to improve the life and the nature and to improve the planet as much as you want. That's the one part. And then the other part, I think I was thinking about uh, what to respond uh, uh, to it in the moment, and I think it is are we as, human, uh, as humans, are we responsive enough ourselves? And so what is it what keeps us from taking the right directions? And uh, it is, I think if you have read the book from Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, we are pretty much evolutionary triggered. So if we eat sugar, we are happy. Uh, we know white sugar is not a good solution to us. We are, we, are, we are prone to be, to be in the rich world. We are prone to, uh, to succumb to convenience. I mean, this was called by the church as sloth. It was the biggest sin. So we, if you, you, can, you can, you take the electric stairways, you, uh, you drive a very big SUV these days, you come in and fly by plane wherever you want to go, and, and, and we eat, even here on the conference, sorry to say, that meat. 
So we, are, we, are, we have this kind of, uh, uh, in, in, the inner, in, in our inner, inner self, yeah, we, have the, uh, we don't have the ability to control ourselves. And at the same time, I was thinking it is, I think I would just want to say the scientists here in the room to give a real heads up, I think you almost can't improve on what you're doing. I mean, you should all get more funds and for, for specific solutions. But actually, we have neglected for decades the other parts, the humanities and sociology. A lot of the solutions are economic solutions, a lot of solutions are uh, questions of better distribution, and they're about psychology and they're about teaching in the schools to get it done. And that is actually, if we really want to make a change, I would, start, I would also start there. Apart from the scientific yeah. solutions, which, I mean, you have seen it, I, can't, I don't want to summarize them, but they are just terrific and fantastic. So the science also comes with funding, and you mentioned funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also are, if I'm not mistaken, involved in shaping funding or trying to get funders to understand where would be more impactful areas to, to invest and mm -hmm. fund their research. Um, in your view, do you think funders are listening to the signs, the warning signs of the planet? Are they responding to that, or is it more driven by, you know, merit and excellence and supporting certain kinds of science or are funders looking at the state of the planet and saying, let's put science funding in certain areas that is critical. Uh, do I think you see that? If, if you look at the long-term trends, of course, I mean, you've seen it today, the number of scientific papers is growing, funding overall is on a, on a good track. If you look at a little bit deeper down, I think you see quite differences. Interestingly, for example, in, in, in the climate sciences and climate change, yes, the output of papers has increased by 250% over the last uh, seven years. That's uh, pretty good. Um, but if you look at the funding itself, interestingly, we had a peak around Fukushima and then a little bit of dwindling down. Uh, the same is with epidemics. Yeah? You, have a little, you had a peak in 2013, this was the avian uh, flu and all that, and it, it trickles down. So the, the question on, on funding for the, for, the, for the future, and if you, want, if you, if you adhere to, to them to the problem, is uh, being persistent and have a long-term view. And that is sometimes, that is sometimes what, we are, what, what we are missing. Yeah? It's a little bit, you share out a grant and then you go somewhere and it's not clear whether subsequently you get another grant. Mm. You have some nations, actually, which I see, I mean, if you look at uh, funding in China, what I, I find surprising is how systematically they think about trying to improve the quality and the quality of their paper and research over a long period of times. I mean, synchrotrons, being, being, being sought through with funding until the year 2030. Nobody in the West has that kind of mindset to think along. And if you go there, I go there very regularly to China, is every year, they are, they are hitting the goals. I mean, Western, some Westerns say, hey, China doesn't have a lot of creativity, but they're doing it. So what I would call for, in, in that sense, if I, I'm, not, I'm not shaping the funders, yes. but I only can give transparency, or we can mm -hmm. only give transparency. But I would say, try to be more persistent, be, be more systematic, and, and, and actually also a little bit what I find is they are, uh, um, it, it is, it's more tactical and it's not holistically to think around as a subject area, the discipline as a whole. Mm. Number one. Number two, of course, there's a lot of funding coming from commercial companies and they, are, they have huge incentivization to, uh, to, um, to, I mean, to get better research and, uh, in, in those fields. And for example, if you take AI, and um, AI being paired with uh, uh, um, the funding in genetics, for example, then we have to make sure as well uh, for the future that we, that we, we keep not only uh, the text open, but also the data open. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say also to the funders, uh, please do keep the data open. And actually on a global scale, we should also think about how do we keep the, a, a balance that is healthy in AI expertise across the world. Because if we don't do that, then, then you, you, have a, you, uh, you have a polarization yeah. and a lot of research will fall down uh, in between. But let's look a little bit more at the funding thing, because if you take Switzerland, for example, Switzerland has a very strong investment into yeah. sustainability. And there is an index called the Environmental Sustainability Index, and Switzerland's number one. 
of course, Scandinavian company, uh, countries, you know, Finland, and so they're also at the top. But uh, what we're seeing more recently is also some other areas like Africa, Kenya, you know, two years ago they banned plastics. Yeah. Uh, India is, is moving completely to having renewable energy sources for imports and huge projects. So it's not quite a correlation between how much money or GDP goes into research, but there is some new shifts or, that are going into supporting sustainability type of research. Do you think other countries or is it just China that's... I mean, we know China is really taking the ball running. They have to. They have to wear masks and they're becoming very aware. But are there other countries, you think, that are responding? I mean, it's the Western world, Germany... I think, I think the picture, picture is quite mixed, Henry, uh, to, be, to, to be frank. Yes. If you look at a lot of indices, you will see still that uh, uh, the poor countries and India is, is, not, a, is not a rich country yes. um, um, is, is causing a lot of pollution as well. Mm -hmm. And you have China also burning coal on the surface, which is a huge uh, uh, polluter. But they're making strides. And then if we cleaned up seven rivers in the world, we wouldn't have a, uh, this plastic problem in the mm -hmm. ocean. Yeah, it's seven rivers only. And the rich world could contribute to, to clean this up. There is a huge inconsistency. Take my own country. So we, are, we, we have in Germany, we have put a lot of effort into renewable energy. But guess what? Just last week, they signed a deal to say, we keep our brown, co brown coal plants open until 2035. And one brown coal plant is as bad as all the, the black coal plant together. It is an amazing polluter. And here is this, this let's say, this gr so-called green uh, country. We are inconsistent, or United States, best research, and also in climate change, actually, very, 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 uh, uh, very much at the top there, yeah? But United States, in terms of pollution, is a, is a huge uh, polluter. So it is, coming back to what I said in the beginning, it's, it's, we, need to, we need a mentality change. Mm -hmm. yeah? And um, thanks to Greta Thunberg, yeah, I think, <laughs> I mean, you need sometimes the next generation to take over and to, to formulate the discourse, it is a, um, this is what we, what, we, what we need more from. Well, talking about the next generation, yeah. you, I mean, everybody's probably aware of the response of the kids. Yeah. The children are responsible. They're going to the streets and starting to demonstrate. And it's sort of, I think it was, I don't know if you all saw this amazing um, presentation given by this 11-year-old girl to the European Parliament. Very moving. If you haven't seen it, you should absolutely watch it. So the kids are going to, what kind of planet are you guys leaving us? You know, we need a planet that's healthy. Kids are starting to demonstrate. And um, do you think that they feel we're just not getting it? <laughs> or we're not listening? <laughs> I think they have all the reasons because we, I mean, we, we, Coming back to the 70s, the, the, a, a car yeah, in Germany, and, and Volkswagen Golf, had a, had a weight of 750 kilograms. Now the Golf weighs 1,350 kilograms with all the material science in the world. It's double the weight. And if you want to buy an electric car, you, you, you move 2.5 tons around you to, for your own 70 kilograms. Yeah? Mm. That can't be an environmentally uh, positive. So we are not getting it. I mean, we're really, we are, we are, we are, I, I just... I just bought for my home a, a very small printer and I say, how much plastic do I get for the printer for only 80 euros? This is some, something, I mean, it's great that the, 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 the costs are going down. So we are not, I think we are, we are not really getting it. I think my worry about the young generation, as much as I like that they are now going out in the streets, I, I only, we have to do something that they don't feel like the Arabs after their spring. We have to really think about that. If, that's, if, if, they, if they are left with, with the kind of uh, a delusion that nothing is happening, nothing has changed, then we, we, are, we are very, very close to lose another generation for a political discourse and for a better change in the future. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that thinking about not getting it, I mean, we've seen in this that there are problems, but we've also seen that there are lots of solutions. And I think that what we are not somehow yeah. getting at is that actually there are lots of solutions. We heard from Jay that there's yeah. these incredible solutions yeah. to get medicines out there. We have alternative energy yeah. solutions. We have alternative plastics. There are already right. so many solutions out there. You almost feel like, what's the problem? Yeah. I mean, we just have to get it out there. There's, there's already solutions where you can take a big 
fridges size container and suck carbon out of the atmosphere of a factory and turn it zero. Mm -hmm. So if you made yeah. a billion of them put on the planet, we'll solve this problem tomorrow. So Mahmoud, I mean, Mahmoud is, an, uh, I think, the perfect person to explain to us or help us understand why we're not getting these kind of solutions implemented. Mahmoud is um, the chairman of the U.S. Council for Competitiveness. He's been the president of Takeda Pharmaceuticals, uh, the vice chairman of uh, PepsiCo. So he's seen it from the medical side, the distribution side, the competitiveness side. And now he's also the, the CEO of Life Biosciences, which is a radically innovative company that is trying to make sure that we all live long and healthy lives. So Mahmoud, how do you see this challenge of getting the impact out there? And specifically, you have made quite a strong point about the difference between a technological innovation or between invention and innovation. So thank you. Um, let me frame it very simply and maybe uh, move to then how do you convert invention to innovation and give you an example. In my mind, I've always thought about invention as something that, you know, you create a new idea, a new process, a new object, and you create data around it, might file patents, certainly often publish. But it remains an invention until it makes a difference in somebody's life. When it makes a difference in somebody's life, that's when it becomes an innovation. Mm -hmm. And often, we have reams and reams and volumes of inventions sitting in archives and data sets, but they're not innovations. The inventor may think they're innovation, but until it actually changes either how we do things, what we do, et cetera, it's not an innovation. And so what does it take? So, you know, Bracken, myself, anybody uh, thinking about it from an industry point of view has to think about, you start with an invention and what will it take to become an innovation? And the first thing, it's gotta be a differentiated idea, mm -hmm. right? If it already exists, it's not gonna do much. So you take this differentiated idea and the second th piece of, out of three ingredients that you need, the second one, is you actually have to have a deep understanding of the domain in which that technology is going to get applied. Mm -hmm. Whether it's software, hardware, medicine, food, it doesn't matter. Domain expertise is critical. In the consumer industry, we call it market knowledge. In medicine, it might be the healthcare system. In food, it may be the agricultural system. But you have to have deep domain knowledge. And mm -hmm. often, inventors lack this knowledge of the domain. And that's where partnership comes in. Because until you bring domain experts with the technology experts together, nothing happens. And most startups actually fail, not because the technology is not a good idea, but they don't have the domain knowledge. And there are many barriers in the domain knowledge. It might be government, it might be regulatory, it may be the health system, the agricultural food system, it may be NGOs, whatever. And I think, Acceptance in the domain is a good example. I think if nothing else, GMO taught the food industry that you can't get ahead of the domain. The technology might have been brilliant. You can sit on one side of the fence or the other. But domain essentially not only limited its growth, in many markets killed it. Mm -hmm. Now, most geneticists will tell you they have no problem with the technology, but that was it. Now, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. That's two out of the three. The third is what is the business operating model that's gonna actually sustain this capability in the consumer market space. And I'm not just mm -hmm. talking about financial market, it could be in the nonprofit world, but it's still gotta sustain it. And that means what's the operating model, what is the financial model, what is the capital model. And when I've seen true innovation, all three boxes not only were ticked, but you had to excel in at least two out of those three, mm -hmm. and almost always three out of those three. When you get that right, you actually now have converted that invention to innovation. Now I'm gonna give you a very simple example illustrated on the discussion we had today. Five, six years ago in my former life as vice chairman of PepsiCo, I also ran global R&D in agriculture, one of the biggest food companies in the world. It's interesting to hear today's talks. I asked one of our teams to say, listen, if we took every technology that already has been invented, and the, the limit was you can't invent anything new, but take everything that's already been invented and go into the United Kingdom where we had large farms. PepsiCo has about 10 million acres of farming input. And do a pilot experiment where you deploy precision agriculture 
robotics, sensors, the latest in microbiome capability, all of that, and deployed it on our farms, could you cut water use by 50%? Half it, not 5 or 10%, cut it by half. Cut the nitrogen and carbon footprint by half and not decrease yield. In five years, we reported the results, they achieved it. Mm -hmm. So we were able to cut water use by half, that's 80% of the fresh water on the planet. We were able to cut nitrogen footprint by half, and we were able to actually increase yield, and we also track labor practices. So the question then is, we had domain knowledge, we knew the technology existed, so what has been the limiting factor as to why this isn't getting deployed. So I know I was an academic once. Every academic wants, let's go and write another research grant and discover the next widget or sensor or drone or satellite. The, actually, the reality of it was, the example I just gave you, everything already exists. It's like you've got a kitchen with all the ingredients, you just need the recipe. But the barrier here was we didn't have the financial capital model, we didn't have the funding system, and so we started an initiative where we now have digitally mapped out of that 10 million acres, 1 million acres of PepsiCo's farming input across 15 countries. Mm -hmm. The UN couldn't have done that, no government entity could have done that, because they'll never get agreement between governments to start sharing the data. My point is, innovation will happen when you actually start to figure out the first two, and then now, the capital model. Because our incentives are wrong, our government incentives are wrong, and you have to put all those together. So I hope that gives you an example. You know what? We can make a lot of difference, but often what is missing are these meetings. The scientists are there, some of the domain people are there, but we haven't figured out what yeah. the bottleneck is and getting them at the table too. Yeah. But it's almost like as scientists, we chase after the one discovery after the next. Because we want to we publish it. We want to publish, we want to publish. We want to save the planet and publish as much as possible, but we don't connect it with the domain and we don't connect it with And the you know, I, I'm a physician, translational mm -hmm. research, up until recently, had a lower pecking order than new breakthrough discoveries. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunately the merit system of the academic world, mm -hmm. and reality is we have so much knowledge sitting that is yet to be deployed, yeah. and we're leaving that behind. There's another interesting, the last time we met that you mentioned, an interesting concept, which is that you have technological disruption, so it's a, dis a disruptive technology, something radical is going to change the way we communicate information or whatever. And then you have a systems disruption. And I think this is also something that scientists are not fully aware of, of these different types of disruptions and how their science could contribute to these different types of disruptions. Could you explain? So what, what we were discussing at that meeting and share with others is a lot of time invention is actually about taking, taking an individual area because, because science by design to control our experiments is a minimal, minimalistic discipline. Let's control everything we can except for the one variable and see if we can make a difference. And so that approach, while it's very valuable from a statistical analysis, et cetera, gets you a breakthrough, it doesn't account for the fact that while you've got this focus in innovation, system innovation may take seven, eight, ten variables with small changes that actually not only are additive but synergistic. And that is very powerful in the deployment. There are very few companies that actually do systems innovation. You know, if you take the computer chip manufacturers, they kept making faster and faster chips of software programmers little bit better soft, and I'm going into Bracken's mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. but to do end-to-end -end system innovation is a whole different thing. In many of these complex problems that we're talking about, mm -hmm. changing healthcare system, taking the food supply chain and changing it, we are going to have to have system level innovation, not device or specific point innovation. That's going to take even more collaboration, which is, I think, one of the powers of the yeah. ecosystem you're building. If without system innovation, this can't be done, and without multiple ways of collaboration, this can't be done. So even though there are scientific discoveries, technological disruptions, somehow we also have to solve that systems disruption to get, you know, start sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere, even if we have the solutions. We still need that. 
Yeah, it's a challenge. And I think maybe we can learn something else from the valley. Um, Bracken is uh, an inventor and uh, investor. He's an art investor, um, uh, but an exponential thinker. Really an exponential thinker. Bracken, and you've seen uh, that everybody talks about exponential companies, exponential innovation, exponential science. And in the valley, you also can see that companies taken 20 years, that used to take 20 years to build a mega company, a billion dollar company. Now they do it in one year, in two years. But most of this, exp these exponential companies are, they don't, they're not science driven. It's like Uber or Snapchat or... You think there's any chance that we could see this kind of exponential companies that we see coming out of Silicon Valley that are really science driven? Because that's, wouldn't we need something like that? To well, you know, I, I guess, I guess, first of all, I think if the, if the founder of Uber or the founder of Snapchat were here, they would say they it's are science driven <laughs> companies. <laughs> okay. uh, but, but not in many ways the kind mm -hmm. of science you're talking about here. I, th I guess I have a couple of thoughts. I think one is uh, I absolutely think that, you know, that companies perhaps in this room uh, and certainly in this, in this field of, of uh, sustainability and biological health improvement, there are going to be exponential companies come out of this in the next several years. It's inevitable. Uh, the second thing is, I guess the thing that I'm most excited about what's happening right now, and it started years ago, but it's, I can feel it, I can just see it blooming, is the fact there are people like Gregoire or David Sinclair who are, who are not only creating the companies, but the shortest distance between them and the marketplace is for mm -hmm. them to create the company and then bring in uh, talent that has the experience of systems thinking to actually help those businesses bloom fast. And that's exactly what is happening now. More and more companies, I'm sure Greg Wire is thinking about, David certainly thought about it with Tristan. You know, so, so that's super exciting. I think the problem we still have is, uh, is the shorthand for how to get big mm -hmm. in Uber and Snapchat mm -hmm. and others is venture, yeah. venture funding. And venture funding is great for certain things. When you know that you need to exponentially scale like that, it's terrific. The problem is most businesses need time. They need time to grow. They need time to develop. They need time to bloom. And the worst thing you can do is bring in someone who's relatively impatient for an exit, mm -hmm. which impatient could be five years, six years. Yeah. Uh, bring venture funds into it where there's, they have their own demand. So I think the secret's out there, and it's happening right now. It's happening sustainability. It's happening in a lot of spaces we, we, we heard today, which is angel funding. Mm -hmm. And you know the disproportionate wealth that's been created over the last 100 years in the world is now uh, overdue in investing back into angel funding, which is long-term sustainable in every way. And I think it's starting to happen. I think Bill and Melinda Gates are a great example. Mark Zuckerberg set up, they, she, he and his wife have set up a foundation. I think, and it doesn't have to be the really, the, the multi-billionaires, it can be the people in this room. But this, this idea of really using uh, angel investing to create patient money to, to, to unlock the power of people like Greg Warren and David Sinclair and allow them to do, mm -hmm. to publish paper after paper and go after mm -hmm. every new idea and let other people pick up the ball and run with them, mm -hmm. I think can really accelerate uh, the, 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 the move from invention to innovation to, to life improvement. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that it's, it's such a challenge, but don't you think that the scientist still has to find, if you take, some, for example, David or, or Gregoire, you, to get an exponential company, you need something to trigger it, make it go viral. You need to, maybe it is the systems innovation that you need. Maybe it is capital, but is it only capital? Somehow you need something to go viral. I mean, Uber was two years and it's a mega company because people just saw the, f the functionality of it. Somehow it takes longer for science companies, but maybe there's an ingredient we're missing which would trigger these science-driven exponential companies? I, I, I guess I'm... Is it uh, just money? Just well, I think things. money's a part of it. But again, as I'll say again, I think sometimes you can go too fast. And mm -hmm. I think they're, they're, the world is littered by inventions that try to go too fast into the path of being really expanded. And, mm -hmm. and they blow up too. And I, I, I'm not saying we should slow down. Yeah. But I think the, the, uh, the, 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 the pathway from you know, experimentation and creation to really solving global problems is getting shorter and shorter. I'm actually very, very optimistic. And I do think over the next decade, you're gonna see some big changes in the biological sciences and you will see some exponential, mm -hmm. exponential benefits. Maybe they won't be companies, they'll be flowing into other companies mm -hmm. as, they're, as they're bought and exited and things. Maybe what I just want to add one yeah. thing to build yeah. on that. 
if you look at many of the exponential growth companies, the examples you gave, they're either virtual and social through the internet, so it's data that's exponential, there's an exponential value because of uptake, or Uber, Airbnb, they're actually companies that are digital but using installed existing infrastructure. Mm. But they didn't have to build the infrastructure. That's key. That's the key. Now, the, with health and technology and science, if you actually can leverage existing infrastructure, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But if you are in the business of supply chain physical, you know, coming from medicine and food, nobody's going to virtually eat food mm -hmm. and nobody's going to virtually eat medicine, right? <laughs> and at the end of it, there's going to be a device, there's going to be a drug. And so one of the things is you actually have to change the installed infrastructure or transition it. And what I usually say is you have to rewire this plane while you're flying it. Mm. You can't land the plane, stop operations, and take off Change again. Change the wheels. It doesn't while happen racing. that way. And so one of the barriers mm. is that. So the companies that have, everybody keeps talking about these exponential companies, they actually have almost always leveraged existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you probably saw the, the map that Camilla showed of all the downloads yep. of the open access articles. Yep. And when we did this analysis first, it was like shocking. We saw these huge number of downloads from Silicon Valley and Shenzhen. And um, if you combine that with, I think that, you know, Peter Diamandi sort of had this idea to form the Singularity University to try to get companies to understand what kind of science is coming down the road. And maybe yeah. that's also where one can get an exponential, where in general more science is coming into companies. Do you think that the, the, science, the companies are understanding what kind of science is coming down the road? No, I don't. I, I think, you know, I, I think it, you know, if you walk through kind of historically what used to happen, it used to be that uh, companies had these massive, IBM and others had these massive uh, in, you know, kind of uh, research mm -hmm. programs and, and they'd fill, the, fill buildings with people. And I think as time's gone on, then they started to acquire companies that were building this research. And I think what's the next step is having, uh, you know, having a more direct connection mm -hmm. between what's happening in universities and research uh, institutes around the world and just drawing that to market faster. But, but I, I'll repeat what I said. I love the fact that today, you know, you, you, you don't have to be a research scientist to create a company. Yeah. You don't have to be a research scientist who's an entrepreneur to create a company. You can do it relatively quickly because yeah. there's enough access to capital now. And that's just going to improve as, as time goes on. So I think that's really the answer is mm -hmm. having the, uh, the, the creators push the technology out rather than expect companies to know what's going yes. on everywhere. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if I were, if I were Gregoire, I, it, rather than wait for somebody to come to me, and I bet he's not, I would be saying, <laughs> who, are the, who are the people that I'd like to get in touch with? I'd mm -hmm. be picking them because the money's out there. Mm -hmm. And they, they're waiting to invest it. You know, there are angel investors waiting to invest waiting. In, in longevity for mm -hmm. David Sinclair, and he know, you guys know it. It's just, you've got to go reach out there and let them know what you're up to. So maybe that's a lesson for scientists to realize that all the potential is there. The solutions are there, the potential is there, the money is mm -hmm. there. There are experts that can help us with domain knowledge. We do need to understand what it takes to turn a scientific idea into an innovation and into a disruption, into a systems disruption and make a real difference. And then maybe we can get some of these amazing solutions out there. So I think that with that, I mean, do uh, you want to have another comment, uh, Stefan, or...? No, I think, I think we left a little bit out to what government can do, mm -hmm. and I think it's a question of regulation and deregulation. Yeah. Both. Yeah, so I think uh, FDA, fast track, uh, faster track approval yeah. on the one hand would be good. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and when it comes to environmental issues, why don't we have a do not smoke campaign? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, I mean, that uh, was so effective, and we don't have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank Let's you. thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you.